Welcome once again to Mind Hijack. Thank you for the feedback you have been giving me. Every week I provide an interesting topic. And today I'm going to bring you something about multiple personality disorder. The word multiple personality disorder bring up images that are given to you in the media in believing what multiple personalities are. Today, I'm going to share with you a true multiple personality disorder story. The images that you see on television about people who murder suffer a great deal. I'm about to introduce you a journey not just for me, but for the patient. And this is about a patient who became special to me because she taught me how to be a great psychiatrist. And please forgive me if I am moved by this topic. If I periodically tear up, it is because the amount of knowledge that she showed me. Because of this patient, I've been able to become a very good psychiatrist. And she taught me a great deal how to have compassion towards other patients. The story begins back in 1991, when I became a psychiatry resident at the University of Texas. I was first a resident in surgery, and I was very naive what psychiatry was about. The personality of surgeons are that, that sometimes you have to be very emotionally distant to do your work. You deal with life and death situation, and you have to maintain objectivity. This kind of environment makes you into a very different person, and going into psychiatry was a whole different world for me. I remember I had to pick a subject. And the subject was assigned to me that at the end of the third year, I had to present my case to see how I trained. This subject, I had no idea how complex it was, other than that I was given to me by a professor who is now deceased named Dr. Gomez, Dr. Efrain Gomez. Very grateful for this man as he took me to a journey of learning about psychiatry and learning about myself. Because of him and another professor named Dr. Hornsby, both are now passed on they left behind this legacy, how to become a better psychiatrist. Let me tell you this story. The pictures behind me, I will discuss as these were the pictures of the patient who I treated. They look pretty bold and pretty scary, but there is a very compassionate journey. The journey begins like this. First, you have to understand what multiple personality disorders. People have these images that you walk into a room and you change your voice at the whim, people with true multiple personalities have suffered a great deal of trauma. If you remember, the brain operates in certain ways to protect itself from pain and from injury, from disease. Multiple personality disorder is the outcome of a very injured person who suffered a great deal at a very young age. The suffering usually comes from sexual trauma, sexual abuse, physical trauma, physical abuse or emotional trauma. It is a very delicate subject because it usually affects young children and this is how they react when they grow old. Let me take you into a journey of this wonderful person who I met who became my patient. It is the story of a very young girl who describes her memories as she grew up. One of the first memories that she remembers her being carried away into the bed by her father. She remembers this very gentle moment, memories that you and I usually don't forget. The story becomes that the father loved her greatly, but the mother became an alcoholic. The parents of the mother eventually took custody and the girl was taught to believe that the father wanted nothing to do with her. She was raised by grandparents and she has memories of these grandparents that were sometimes cruel. They were always emotionally conflicting to her and not, if not emotionally abusive. Some of the memories that she remembers is that she was traumatized and she had all these nightmares of monsters. I'm gonna show you some pictures of some of the things she used to do. Through life, this person continued, eventually got pregnant accidentally, but lost her baby. She was always told she was not a good person. The grandparents were not very supportive and they taught her that a woman was to be staying at home. The person grew up in a place called Utah, and in Utah, it was a small place of about a thousand people. There, the only thing she had was animals. She would go out in the woods and play with certain animals and rabbits, and she was very attached to a horse that eventually died. These images 
filtered in as she grew older, including painting dead horses. She got married, and unfortunately she got pregnant again because it was forced on her. It was not a desired pregnancy. The boy was taken away from her because the husband believed that she was not capable. She continued to survive in life, and she did not want to return to the grandparents' house. Some of the memories that she remembers sometimes unexplained emotions that sometimes she wished that her grandparents were dead. She did not put this together until later on in counseling. Time went by, she lost her son, she moved on, always wishing to have her son back. She was a very strong woman because she continued, and as she continued in life, she got married again. She married a military man who she followed. There, she didn't see much of him, and because she became so demeaned by the way she was criticized that she was not a good person, she began to engage in multiple sexual affairs, many men. She experienced multiple suicides. Time went by, and she suffered a great deal. She could not put together what was happening to her life other than multiple hospitalizations. By the time I received her, she was 40 years old. She had lost her job. She lost her family. She was able to engage in a relationship with a husband who was very supportive. He stayed with her. And eventually, she came to the clinic after being hospitalized at one of the hospitals associated with the training facility. I had no clue about this woman. All she thought about was suicide. It was a person that nobody wanted. It was a very difficult person because all she thought was death and people were afraid to treat her because nobody wants the patients to die. The professor told me, stay with her, don't surrender. And one of the things she used to do, she would present with different clothes. I couldn't make the connection. Her voice would change. Sometimes she would call herself the whore. Sometimes she would call herself the demean woman. But one of the things that she used to do since she was a little girl, she used to do drawings. It was a way of verbalizing or expressing her pain through pictures. I told my professor about this and he says, why don't we use this as a tool to heal her? She can communicate with you in words. Sometimes she would come with a different voice I had no clue with multiple personalities, but this is a warning to therapists. When you have patients who have true multiple personality disorder, they cannot tell you that they're experiencing one person to another. True personality disorder people don't even recognize that they're shifting from one person to another. And the biggest problem that we have in counseling that the some therapists will actually acknowledge each individual personality and in doing so what you're doing is you're allowing these personalities to become worse you're not doing any healing you cannot acknowledge that they have different personalities in time she brought me these paintings and treatment was about a year and a half we tried medications me being very naive in counseling I became like a doctor does write a prescription pad and write her medications. I thought that by giving her these medications, I would heal her. Medications only provide relief for anxiety, but sometimes she would get worse. And I began to learn that the less I was attached or connected to her in a therapeutic, she became worse. In other words, she felt I wasn't listening to her. And you know what? She was right. She taught me something very valuable as a physician. You have to listen to your patients. That's the, the knowledge that she taught me. Please forgive me, but it's a very, it was a very moving and training moment with me when I went to, the, to my, my professor. And one of the things I've learned is that by engaging the patient and listening to what she was saying, she became more integrated. She felt more connected and more healing. But one of the things I discovered about her, that she would bring me these paintings, all kinds of paintings. And I said to her, you know something? Show me what you have done. I'm about to show you a series of paintings of what she drew. And she was able to describe her life story. One of the things that we did is something we call symbolic realization. You see, symbols 
a very powerful language tools for the subconscious mind. Your children do it all the time. It taught me how to read paintings and pictures of how you express yourself. It actually taught me very advanced levels of how to look at artwork. The subconscious mind has a tendency to express itself much better in a picture-like manner. Children do it all the time. The first things that you see in children, they draw a father and a mother in stick figures. But if you pay attention, some of those pictures are telling you a great deal. Pictures can reveal anxiety. Pictures can reveal psychosis. Pictures can reveal all kinds of things about the human being. Pictures are a way, it's a catharsis for children sometimes when they're frustrated. In fact, good counselors who have good backgrounds in paintings will look at these pictures and will understand what the child is suffering. It became a tool for me to allow her to heal. I will show you some of these pictures now. I like to advise my viewers that some of these pictures might be very disturbing, but it's the mind of a person who suffered from a lot of pain. But these pictures became the focal point of her healing and my understanding of her subconscious mind. One of the first pictures that she showed was a hand coming out of a tub. We weren't sure what this was about. It was a black hand coming out of a bathtub and she recalls these pictures and these nightmares of a hand in the tub. Another picture that she would draw eventually was a picture of her killing herself. And on one of them you will see her cutting her hand. There was guns and pills. These were all the thoughts of being suicidal. She always tried to find a way to kill herself and she did attempt suicide multiple times and she did not succeed. There are pictures of her with disfigurement and it was beginning to see very psychotic stuff. By psychotic, I mean the body didn't look like a body. The head did not look like a head and everything was fragmented. For those who understand the symbolic meaning of these pictures, it represents early psychosis. I am so grateful because she taught me these principles. Eventually, she would describe pictures of how she felt at work, scattered. She was already giving messages of how much she was hurting, and they were very moving, very immature and infantile pictures. But one of the things I noticed is that some of these pictures had a lot of sexual content. And I don't think she realized that there might be some sexual abuse. Now, and this is a warning to therapists, if you suspect sexual abuse in your client, let your client tell you. Do not entice fantasies because you will create these images for them. When the person's mind is right and the timing is perfect, the patient will tell you that they've been abused. The way the patient will express herself of sexual abuse are usually in pictures, phallic pictures. There was a very moving picture when her horse died and the many rabbits that she used to play with. One of the things that she used to do when she grew up because of the emotional abuse of the grandparents and she was always put down is to go into the woods where she had animals. Her friends were animals and she would express this. Realizing that she had an incredible talent, I said, why don't you go to art school? And I want you to go to art school because I think you're very talented. That movement that I made for her, that motion, that expression, gave her a little hope and it turned out it was not disappointing to her and it shocked me. And she was able to describe certain things, the monsters, the things that would torment her and all the issues that she had. Behind me, I'm about to introduce her first painting that she left behind. Now, one of the things that we are taught in psychiatry, you do not take gifts and you do not take things from patients but she wanted me to have this painting and I'll explain why. She was able to put together her whole life story in one painting. Behind me, you will see this painting that she brought with pride about her pain. You can see here, she said, this is me, I am dead. You can see that her legs are disconnected and she's cold and she's dead. Here are the worms that are waiting for me to die so they can eat me. Look before me, the monster that would chase me. Look in my bed, 
the monster is there. The monster is there above and below, taunting me. The flames and the fire and the fear. This monster did not only represent her psychosis, but early sexual abuse by many people when she was only six years old. She did not know how to verbalize it, so she painted it. Eventually, she made the connection. She said, look at me, I am a monster. And she would draw this window that she could not touch. And if you look closely here, it is a fish. I feel like a fish out of water, always being baited by the worm. The worm represented sexual abuse. When a person is sexually abused, and they have no power, and they're very young, they feel like a fish out of water. Try to imagine the image of a fish flapping out of water, helpless, that cannot defend itself. It was because of this painting, and when she brought this painting, she cried. And at the same time, she was thankful. Once in a while, she would come with many personalities, and there was one way to treat this. I would say, when a personality would come out, personalities come out to hide the pain and the guilt that you feel when you've been traumatized. It is a mind's way to defend itself from a great deal of pain that they bear and guilt. A person will appear sometimes as an angry person who is violent. It is the side that wants to leash out of all the anger that they've been holding back. She came as a very sorrowful person. I'm about to show you on the screen a series of painting. And when she was at the last draw and I said, doctor, I can't do this anymore. I want to die. I want to kill myself. Imagine the fear that brought out of me that I would lose this patient. I had to maintain composure. I had to figure out a way that to satisfy what she wanted to do but not in real life. What I'm about to show you on the screen is the pictures that she brought. She showed me her pain. This is, this is my pain, what I feel. And this is what I feel when I shoot myself with the bullet through my head. I am dead. She drew her picture when she was dead. And then at the end of the other picture, it shows the self-pity and the sorrow that she experienced. And I cannot show you the other picture, but it was a picture of a self-image. It was the first time she painted herself not as a monster, but as a woman. I realized that we were making progress. It was during that session that she began to put herself together also. The need for medications were less. Therapy was about to be over and she had to move. It was a year and a half later and she said goodbye to me. She wanted to show me one more picture or two more pictures and she wanted me to keep another one and I'll explain why. And one of the pictures that you will see here is her with a mask hiding from herself and you can see the many masks of the multiple personalities. She began to recognize that she fragmented. Her multiple personalities began to disappear. She said, I want you to also understand how I feel. And she did. She left me this picture right here. And this picture she said, this is the knife that I want to die in the blood the knife that I think about when I want to die. These horns is the voices that I hear, her hallucinations. And if you notice something peculiar about how she drew herself, this looks like a uterus. Subconsciously, hysterical comes from the word hysterectomy or the word from uterus, a Greek derivative. In the old days, there was something about the uterus. She drew her uterus 
and it showed how her subconscious mind was so focused on this. It also represented the pregnancies that she lost. I'd like to tell you that towards the end of the counseling, she discovered too late that her father really loved her. And it was the grandfather who was lying to her all these years. She eventually united back with her son shortly before or during this counseling. She saw her son all over again. She was able to be happy in many ways. In this picture, she continues, this is the monster inside of me, and this is my fake mask. But if you notice the mask, it doesn't look like a monster. It looks more like a human. And she would say, when I die, this is my soul crying down the sink, and this is my prison. She said to me, keep these two pictures. I don't want this with me anymore. She left him in my office as a way to leave her disease behind. It was a very moving moment for me, and please forgive me, but it is a very emotional and true story about a person who was, able, was suffering and was able to recover. The last picture she left for me, when she had to leave, I said, Doctor, I have to move. But thank you for everything you've done. She said to me, I want you to see this picture of me. She left me a picture of a very young girl, a 12-year-old girl. She says, this is me. I'm 11 years old. She looks like a little girl with very with stockings, hypersexual items, high heels, holding in front of her a teddy bear. You can see the details of the picture. She did this with a piece of pencil and carbon. It shows the anxiety, one of the things I've learned about painting. But more important, she wanted to convey to me, I was like a child that was made into a woman too soon. So this story that I just shared with you was a picture and a story of a patient who became my best teacher of all. I tell my colleagues, your patients are not textbooks. They create textbooks. They bring to you new cases, whether it's pathology or whether it's psychopathology, they become your best patients. Your most difficult patients are your best teachers. You have to redefine success. But I wanted to show you that she may have still have some anxiety and she still may have some depression, but guess what happened to this woman? She felt better and that to me was success. Like I did to this patient, doctors, you can do the same to your patients. I hope that this story can show you and give you hope to treat people who have no hope. I'd like to thank you once again for joining me in this very special presentation today. I'd like to thank the feedback of all my patients and the feedback of many out there who have been subscribing to this channel. If you have any questions about this, write below and let's see. For now, thank you for joining me. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel. Please keep giving me feedback so I can provide you with more interesting topics.